This is Annabelle Guberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you. On the thief of June 2019, I had the pleasure of meeting with Bob McDade, who is the co-founder of the music talent agency Manners McDade. He founded this agency a long time ago with his life partner, Ms. Manners, and turned it into one of the music talent uh, powerhouses of the UK. They also have presence in Los Angeles, as they will, um, Bob would explain during the, uh, the podcast. And um, Manners McDade has become one of the go-to purveyors of musical talent in the UK for um, video content producers, such as advertising agencies, uh, brands, film directors, documentary directors etc so for whenever you need some audio content customized audio content for your video content your video footage then you can reach out to bob and um, his team in order to uh, obtain some uh, customized music scores and um, and recordings so yeah it was fantastic to meet up with uh, uh, such a um, prestigious member of the uh, uh, UK music industry and I had a delightful time with Bob on the 5th of June as you will uh, witness by listening to the uh, following podcast. Oh, do you want me to start? Okay. Hello <laughs> podcast listeners, I, am, I have the pleasure of being in the presence of the imminent Bob McDane, uh, co-founder of the film music and advertising music agency Manners McDade, but he co-founded with his wife, Miss um, Manners, Catherine, 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 Manners. Catherine Manners. It's a delight to be in his presence because he's a man who, who, who has a lot of knowledge on, uh, on this field. I came across Bob um, working on, uh, on uh, a deal for a client who, who is a music uh, uh, composer in the ad advertising business a year and a half ago and um, Bob was, uh, was very resourceful in, um, in providing his um, insightful view on, um, on how a music composer can get or not an agent. So, too kind. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Over to you, Bob. Uh, yes, as you say, uh, um, we have been approaching our 20th year of operation now. We founded in 2001. Uh, we started off with one client. Right. Uh, and that was a composer who had, through his friendship with a director, long term friendship, had. Um, been offered the opportunity to score a film for Disney. Wow. And yeah, it was a big leap in his career. And uh, he'd been doing it. Hmm? A friendship with. Uh... Uh, well, well uh, composers often have a at least one friendship with a director or a producer who takes them to each subsequent project. Fantastic. Um, I wish I could remember his name, but Matthew Herberts. The composer, uh, he has just scored Gloria Bell, which is on at the cinema at the moment, Julian Moore. And that's a friendship with a Chilean director whose name has escaped me. His first film was A Fantastic Woman, and then he oh, did... Oh yes, I've watched it. It's a lovely film. film. Uh, and then he did Disobedience, um, and now Gloria Bell. Uh, Rachel... Vice and, and Vice, yes. Rachel McAdam, yes. yes. That's right, yes. Which a beautiful I'm... film, actually. Um, oh yes. So, uh, so, oh, so he's really on his first so, year. So, composers often have 
Yes, it was. A, well, he'd done one for me before, but it was a while ago, and it, things haven't worked out as he would have liked. And I think he was. Um, he stepped back for a while. Okay. And went back to making albums and, and DJing and playing gigs, etc. Uh, and then that opportunity came up. But my point was, yes, just about every composer we represent will have at least one strong association with a director. And that director will take them on subsequent projects, whether TV or film. It's fantastic. And so, for you, you just said that that was your first client. Ooh. You mentioned that composer. So for you, clients are actually the composers. Clients are not the, uh, the, end, the end clients, no. i.e. The, the brands or the, uh, uh, well, the film directors or the film production companies. No, it's, it, our, our clients are the composers who are signed with us for representation. I see. And that was how we started as a composer agency because that project went well. And he would tell his friends, so a friend of his asked if we would represent him, and it just grew from there. Really. And that was for about eight years, and so we had quite a large roster. Yeah. And then we found our clients were asking us if we knew good publishers. And there, there aren't really any specialist publishers in media music. Okay, so would you mind explaining to us in, in lay terms, layman terms, what that means uh, in the context of film music compositions? Publishing, I mean, would, would that be like managing the relationships with the likes of PRS, the Collecting Society yes, for, for um, um, uh, basically composers and, lyri and lyricists, I suppose, yeah. and, and also ma making sure that the royalties come in and are being paid on a... Well, it's basis. also, it, well, because we also then go to publish them, then our relationship goes all the way through the commission, so we would start off with uh, negotiating the actual contracts for the job. Contra uh, negotiating the, uh, the terms and conditions. But that would be the agent's job. That would be well, well, that as well. And then we would change our hats to be the publisher, and then you would negotiate the publishing terms on the film or TV. So, and so, what does this entail in, in pragmatic terms, uh, negotiating the publishing? Oh, well, it, 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 it's from the very prosaic in that you're ensuring that everything is properly registered. Okay. And with the collective society. With the collective societies. And then, because we are an independent, we have a network of sub-publishers throughout yeah. the world. Like music, music sales? Uh, usually, yeah, usually companies, we usually look for independents like ourselves. Okay. In Paris, we work with Velvetica. I don't know if you've come across that in your work. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, a sub-publisher in each territory. Mm -hmm. And so once the work is registered, you then inform your sub-publishers that this film is shown in their territory at this time I see. and then they make sure the royalties are collected properly from their collection societies from their territories yeah and then the longer term thing is uh, apart from collecting you're also seeking to exploit that publishing if you're if the contract allows it yes that you you now have a library of songs which you can sell on to other projects so we're talking here about um a um a sync license it's or it's a master, I mean, this is perhaps, and, and can you also negotiate some master uh, uh, licenses or do you also... Well, we very we've rarely deal with master licenses because okay. they're usually owned by the record companies, right, right, right. Okay. Um, or if it was a film or a TV, then the production company would own the master more usually. Of course, yeah. Uh, so we, when we sync, it's obviously a good idea if we can also clear the master because if we get a brief and we put tracks forward the nightmare is they choose your track and then you can't clear the master so you have to go to the of label course. and then the label dis it's a mess it's a, well it's often more of a problem with much smaller labels because if you if you're doing a, a sync it can be anything from 500 pounds to fifty thousand pounds if you have a small struggling label suddenly thinks there's a big check here, mm -hmm. they can yeah, they can ask for too much and they can uh, harm that relationship. And because it has to move quite quickly, then the buyer will often just move on. If there's any delay, of course, yeah, they will just go. Especially in the advertising world, it yeah, needs to be really snappy. And, uh, tell me about it. 
yeah. <laughs> I think it needs to be done yesterday. Why, um, why is it advertised that agencies always ring with the brief on Friday afternoon and tell you they need it first thing on a Monday? Oh my God, is that what, right? Yeah, is that what well, they do? It's, Probably they do it on purpose. No? I, I have no idea why they do it. I think the week passes them by and then they, they suddenly realise there's something they haven't done. <gasps> <laughs> I don't know, but they're notorious. Is that a nice wine? But we still, um, it's very acceptable. Yes. Okay, good. Very acceptable. Thank you. Which, so which so you going, going right back to the beginning, we start yes. with a single composer, uh, then we built our composer roster over the next few years, then some of our composers were asking if we could recommend a publisher. We looked around, we couldn't really find one which specialised in meeting music. So really? At the time? At that the would time. be like what, the um, 90s, right? It was the yeah. noughties, yeah? Late 90s. Late 90s. And, and the reason we got the job with the composer who was writing for Disney is that yeah. his publisher was being obstructed and demanding that they kept the publishing. Mm. But that, that That's never, not gonna that happen. never happens on Disney. Big, Especially with Disney. Yeah, on Disney. <laughs> on Disney. We had a phone call with a Disney lawyer, I remember well. Uh, and he said, if we would forego one aspect of the rights, we could keep all the money that was collected from the cinema box office in the States. And that might have passed us by because we were relatively inexperienced, but I'd worked for a performing rights society, PRS, and I knew okay. that they don't collect at the box office in America. Mm. So he was just trying to... And we confronted him with this and he laughed and he said, look, I work for Disney, I have to get the best deal I can. He just laid it out the reality of it, whereas we were... As we do now, we try and build relationships and be honest and straightforward. Mm. And he was saying, don't make that mistake. When you're dealing with Disney or Universal or Warner's, you know, they're, they're just looking for the best deal and they don't really care mm -hmm. how you do all this. It's not me. Um, I read the, um, a, a book about the, the um, foundation of CAA, the mm -hmm. creative agency, which of course is, is massive today. And um, one of the founders, Michael, Name Michael, I can't remember his surname, but he actually moved to Disney at some point late, later in his career and um, uh, he didn't really like it. So his, his, his wife, ex wife, actually reported uh, a, a, a joke. Uh, one of the famous dear directors who, who, um, who had dealings with Disney said, So, how is it like uh, working for uh, Mousewitz? <laughs> Mousewitz. <laughs> yes, that's cool, but fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I read that, I was like laughing in my bed, I couldn't help myself. That's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so backtracking is slightly, so you said you worked for PRS for mm -hmm. some time, but before this, the, 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 this founding of Man is My Day 20 years ago, what, what, what was it you were up to? Bob? You mean what, were, what jobs were yeah. we in at that time? Well, Okay, yeah, what, what were you doing? Well, I was, I was still at the PRS, that was the end oh, of mine, okay. and I was pretty fed up of it, and <laughs> if you follow the news, you can read that it's still a basket case of a company, it's still having major problems, they've just replaced the chief executive yet again. Yeah, Robert Ashcroft, right? Yeah, so he's they, gone, yeah. and now they have... Uh, Couldn't believe that guy was paid 1.5 million dollars per year. Don't, I was like, don't. well, and, and someone told me, yeah, but he's got to pay for his divorce, right? I was like, yeah, well, <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, I, in the end... Why it, do you think it's like, uh, it's bad? I mean, look at the, the Spanish guy, it's terrible. They just got fined, actually, by the they, antitrust because authority. Because there's no competition. It, it, there's no right, competition yeah. to PRS. Is they the same can, in France? What they can be fucking awful, but they don't, pardon my language, mm. but they don't lose any business. Because where right. else do you go? You know, which is fine. Um, well, well, I mean, yes, although there's, there's been an opening of the market a few years ago when um, a new regulation from the EU allowed um, uh, composers to actually register with yes, whatever EU-based uh, uh, collecting society they wanted. So um, that created a little, a tiny bit of competition. But from what I'm, my, my understanding is, PRS is supposed to be one of the best collecting societies. Well, really. it's, it's frightening to think that. But yes, dealing with gamer, for example, 
Okay. In okay. the name of the German Collection Society. Oh, get me up right there, yeah. They still exist in the 1970s. Everything's right. on paper. Yeah, well, probably everything's in German as well, so yeah. if you're not a German speaker, you're a bit dead. So, uh, so they're kind of slow and very bureaucratic. Really? Um, Sassen is, it seems to have reinvigorated itself. Interesting. Yeah. With Jean-Michel Tron? Yeah, the new absolutely. Guy? They seem to be much more on the ball. Wow. Oh, yes, I, I went to um, uh, the, the Mama two years ago and they were showing the new um, so software in, for um, for uh, members to be able to check their yeah. uh, statement. It seemed to be really on top of uh, everything IT. Uh, and, of course, um, and now there's Impel, the digital rights collection. And yeah. That's yeah, the kind right. of... that's. Thing that swept the rug from under the PRS because people are saying, okay, we're going with Impel instead, uh -huh. like we do. Okay. So, so yes, hopefully the new chief executive will sort it out. She's okay. from a purely business background. What's her name, actually? I've never uh, I can't remember. Okay. Sorry, I'm not even sure she's in position yet. I read the press release. Uh, it's, it's, it's she's completely from outside of music. Yeah, but it's happening at the moment, right? I think yeah, uh, Robert Ashcroft is just about to leave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's exciting, um, but not quite yet. Right. So it's interesting times. So hopefully, because she's from a purely business background. Yeah. And I think sometimes they get too tied up in the idea of it being part of the music industry, mm -hmm. which it is, strictly speaking. Yeah, for sure. But it's more about data and money. Nowadays, yes. It, it's, forget, they have no creative input, so why do they continue to pretend they do? <laughs> I don't know. So I was, yeah. I was, so I was working then almost. In which capacity? Where, where were you? In which team were you? Oh, they, they um, asked me to do their marketing because they've not done any marketing mm. at all. Okay. And their entire approach was to send letters to people saying, "You, you play music in your shop. You must buy a license. If you don't, they'll be Fair prosecuted." Enough. Yeah. So it, it was all. It's not very good marketing, but it was all. It was all stick and no carrot, basically. There was no sense. In, and we tried to add value and say, okay, explain okay. why it was advantageous to play music in your business. And we are, I'll take credit, we um, commissioned academic research into the effects of music in various environments like restaurants, bars, shops. Excellent. Uh, which was very successful. Um, simple things like if you play classical music, and then ask people whether what their impressions of it, they give a much more favourable impression than if you play drum and bass. Right. It's a, it's really simple stuff, and they you can find out how you can make people move around a shop quicker or from music. Yeah, so there are ways you can use it subliminally. Mm -hmm. Not so there's messages underneath that nobody no, can no, hear, no, 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 but, but just yeah. in terms of how it changes people's perceptions of your sure. prices and your atmosphere and your. Yeah. And poppy music, I suppose, pop music to, uh, you know, enhance sales, etc. It et completely uh, depends on the, on the demographic of your customer base, right. etc. And the, all. So that, that was my attempt to change the culture so it wasn't mm. just knocking on and, doors. And bring saying, value, bring value to bring the business values, which yes. are using music. Even my law firm, Preferby, actually received a, uh, a letter like this from Sassem asking, um, please do uh, do pay your royalties because uh, because you are a French business. I'm like I don't play any music in my law firm, you know, offices. So, sure. so, so anyway, that's yeah, it's, it's that idea. If you play music in an office, you must pay a bill. And so, uh -huh. so, they, they, so they were purely knocking on doors and saying it's the law. Mm. Give me your money, and obviously that creates a lot of resentment. Yeah. Uh, so we just tried to change the whole thing. So and bring value to this. And bring value to it and yeah. explain why it was a good idea yeah. and yeah. why this license was worth the money. How long did you stay in this role for, Bob? <sighs> well, I stayed in the role after we actually established the company because... Really? Well, to for sure. revenue, yeah, yeah, to pay the mortgage, simple as yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, you must have worked quite your socks off then. Two jobs? It was very easy at PRS. Okay. <laughs> there was little or no discipline whatsoever. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I remember 98, the 98 World Cup, I think I saw just about every game during the day. Oh, so, God. <laughs> but, 
So it was it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was it was easy work. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, after a while, you realise you're not really. Well, look, you've never achieved. You're, you're, you're getting, well. getting no sort of uh, satisfaction from what you do. Uh, right. You, and the company was very resistant to this. Yeah. They were the the pe yeah. the people on the ground who knocked on the doors saw themselves as law enforcers and they were very My resistant gosh. to any change. I remember we did a conference and got them together and asked them simple questions like what, what's your favourite piece of music? Mm -hmm. And some of them had no answer. And we organised... So they were not passionate about music they anyway? They didn't care about music at all. Wow. Uh, and we would take them to see live music. I can't believe people live like this, you know, just a well, job well, to pay we, the bills. We took, we, took the, we took them on mass to see some live music and it was this beautiful evening and several of them, well, it wasn't an admission from them, but they had never seen live music before. Wow. It's quite extraordinary and these are the people they were sending out to knock on doors and say, well, no, um, so you brought something important to me. <sighs> they're still using that research. <laughs> <laughs> also, were you already married with uh, Catherine at the time, or, or was, I mean, were you already a partnership together, or? Uh, yes, we okay. we got together in '99, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, '99. So was that before you set up the company, Matt? That was Matt? before. Yes. Okay. Uh, we were both unhappy in our jobs, and well, I was unhappy. You were both I was kind unhappy. of unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, for Catherine, she was working for a large music publishers and right. she was working my wife has a, a far more illustrious background in music than do i my background is working in record shops before i went to prs and dj oh, that's so cool. uh, well oh, so you're yeah, coming really from the it's not as cool as my wife who had worked on projects with stockhausen and philip glass and managed sir john taverner that's cool oh, so managed who sir john taverner I don't know him. Uh, well, he's dead now. He was um, okay. he was the first man to release anything on Apple Records, which is the Beatles label. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And he scored New Year at the Millennium Dome. Mm -hmm. He scored the music that was played at midnight. So a prestigious he, British. He, oh, of course. Oh, yeah, he was very established. Sir very, John's Avener. Sir John Taverner. And he we, he wrote a piece of music that was played at Diana's funeral. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. So he, yeah, he's very established and very well regarded. Okay. Um, so that was her background. Much more classical. Mine was much more well, it's less Philip, formal. I, I, I'm starting to discover uh, to to discover the music of Philip Glass. By the way, mm -hmm. is he British or is he no, German? He's American. Oh, he's American. Uh, New Yorker. Right, right, right. He was. Um, how, how, come, how, how, how come she started working with him? Because of the, the business that she was working for were, okay. were their publishers. I'm trying not to name them. Right. Because the reason okay. she was unhappy is the company was run by an old man who'd run it forever mm -hmm. and he didn't like promoting women past a certain point because... Really? Yeah. Gosh. It was very obvious and it became very obvious to my wife when a position opened and they employed somebody and she just thought he's nowhere near as mm. good at his job as am I so that that was where she gave up really mm. and realised that was no there was she couldn't go any further within that organisation. Yeah. So. Well yeah, I mean it happens to I suppose quite a lot of people. I mean I've got I know this couple who we are making custom jewelry out of New York. Um, Ben Amun is a brand, and the man of it's, um, they always say, you know, if you really want to make, to start making real money, you need to have your own business. <laughs> um, it's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, for those who have an entrepreneurial streak, I guess, because you need to find the clients, but um, if and, you do, and, and then I, I agree that's the best way to make real money. Her experiences are reflected in the company today because just about all our staff are women. Okay. Now, I'm not saying we discriminate against men. <laughs> What do you mean in terms of your roster of, um, of composers? You, you, well, we, you we represent more women than any other range. Okay. But in terms of the stuff, they're, but actually, they're I, mainly all women. I think that, that, that's funny because it was actually a, a question that I had set out on my email to, to you prior to this. Uh, since we're on, on this point, um, actually, are there quite a lot of female composers? Because it's quite a lonely job, like, you know, 
initially, I suppose, when you were writing the score and perhaps the, the lyrics as well, if there are any. Studios are still very much male dominated. Oh, is that right? Uh, it's the engineers. Which, like in the recordings? Uh, yeah. Recording. It's still a very male environment. So, therefore. And there's still a. a um, even amongst those people who are commissioning the work, mm -hmm. they're still underlying the outward displays of equality. They're still quite they prefer sitting down with a man. Uh -huh. You know, really? it's still. But and, so, and in terms of ladies who join, um, when I, when you want to become a music composer. Surely you must go to um, the Royal Academy of Music or be sort of um, of um, uh, schools or or well, colleges. Well, in, in London it's the NFTS, the National Film and Television. School. Even for music, for film film composers. Um, not, uh, NFTS is, is an fun. awful lot of our composers come from the NFTS. How interesting! And we uh, attend the, every year. They have the final films made by the students who are passing out, and we go and see those to see if there's any obvious talents. On display. Oh really? You're yeah. doing like a wild casting? <laughs> well, we, 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 oh, love, we love taking Fantastic. young composers yeah, and, sure. and sure. the traditional path is you find um, an assisting job with an established composer. Mm -hmm. That's how ah. you start your career Okay. and that way you're on the inside so you're getting to know everybody and it's, that's the traditional route. And do you see quite a lot of ladies coming out of the NFTS? What do you call that degree? Sind uh, film, music? Composition degree? Yeah, it's a degree? composition. Yes. Composition. Media composition, I forget what right, they right, call right. it particularly. Um, Is it like. Yeah, even, in the, even in the time we've been doing that, there's, yeah. there's far more women than there used to be. It used to be almost a, a male preserve. Because you see, for example, for the legal profession, mm -hmm. it used to be um, definitely skewed towards men joining uh, university to study law. I'm talking about the French. Uh, 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 data here, yeah. but now it's like seventy percent of, uh, of the uh, young graduates who actually join university in the law uh, department are actually females. So I think we're almost in a time when things are changing positively. In that it's not just lip service mm -hmm. that, that that you can see women coming through. Yeah, okay. and even though even the most sexist of men understand that it's no longer in their interest to. Do you know what I discourage say? Discourage or undermine. What, 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 what I always say is, because I see it in my law firm, you know, it's um, the market will talk, you know, the market yeah, will absolutely. give you some, some feedback. Yeah. If they love what you do, whether you are a man or a woman, is irrelevant. If they just, um, if you, if they just like what you do, then uh, then you're, you're in, you know. Yeah, uh, so so that, that's, that's the way. But there's, there's interesting ways that industries will look to look to change things through the through the constitution so they will say we must give we've noticed uh, something like Satchi, i believe Satchi do this okay they have to a percentage of their commissions have to go to female-owned companies seriously yeah so that's a good they way set up of some quotas like positive yes, discrimination quote, yeah and that creates positive change well that's okay well in, okay that's that's quite full-on I think, but yeah. well, okay. If it works, it works. <laughs> um, well, hopefully, we get to a point where you don't need to do that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Oh well. But but <laughs> so we're still not quite there, are we? So when I was studying the market for my client, um, this film composer I, I mentioned at mm -hmm. the beginning of a podcast, um, I noticed he, he mentioned your your your, your agency, and as my guide, obviously. And then I looked at the market, you know, to understand how this field, this this very niche field. Of agencies um, representing uh, music composers for film and advertising and gaming um, uh, music and projects mm -hmm. is, is set up, and I saw that Manus McDade is really at the very top of a, of a crop here. So, did you have a business plan with Catherine to um, to turn it into this? Somehow, powerhouse that it is today, or I feel from my perspective, it's felt it's a, been a very gradual build of the country. Yeah, what, what is it? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we've ever sat down and had a solid plan. We just leave ourselves in a position where we can take opportunities. I think that's a big thing that you are 
nimble enough, you are deft enough yeah. that if a, if an opportunity comes, you can take it because you're not you're not too structured, you're not too rigid. What sort of opportunities are you referring to here? Do you have an example? <sighs> That's a good question. Uh, like you mean you need a, a commission coming in, or I, I suppose sometimes we we've, we've been asked if we can involve ourselves on a project that we have no real experience of okay and our, we don't really think about it we just say yes we can do that God. and then we go away and try and find out how do we do this <laughs> that's daring uh, but it keeps it interesting it keeps you like, like what for example say we have a show well, like I, I, show and okay. we need you to um to do to work on the music background of it is that for example a sort of um, brief well, you would well, get uh, or? So going into book publishing, we've done some book publishing. We know nothing about book publishing, we're not from that background. But a uh, okay. client asked, he said that was a stipulation that of his contract he would sign with us if we could facilitate making this book for him. What a book about what? Uh, it was sheet music with pictures and art in there and... So we just said, yes, of course we can. And then afterwards, we're, what the hell are we going to do? How do we do this? Who do we know? Yeah, I mean, just start. So how do, how do you get paid on such projects? I mean, do you take a commission, uh, like a, a percentage of what is it's going to be? The royalties are nothing on the book, anyway. You know, so. No, it did. Yes, we, we do. We do too. quite a lot of work, which has no. There's no straight yeah, thread it. of revenue. Yeah, okay. You do this because it, 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 it be on the rapport. solidifies. It, absolutely, the oh, French yeah. are composer. Yeah, you solidify that relationship. They trust you more. They see you as yeah. They see you as being able to do these things. They, uh, if they've been to other companies and said we would also, as part of the contract, we also want to do this book, and the other company said that's not our business. You have to go somewhere else. Right. Well, for them, that was the deal break. They're okay. just looking for the person who says, yeah, of course we can do that. Because that, that should be what you're looking for. In your, so you, you, you mentioned, thank you so much, it's, it's really interesting to, not interesting, but it's, it's really fascinating to understand how you make your choices, you know, your, your, your business choices. But so... This, you, neither of us have an MBA. We haven't right. been to business. You've got your intuition. I and mean, well, it's it, uh, I, for me personally, a personal thing, I, I didn't. I was thinking, will my mum ever hear this? I, I never really, <laughs> I never really had a father figure who I liked. I didn't really like my father, but the guidance he gave me was, I would think. What would my father do in this situation? Yeah. And then I'd do the opposite of that. And think, well, <laughs> that must be the right thing to do. And it served me quite well. And we kind of, because my wife and I were both unhappy in our jobs, we think, well, what would they have done? I'll do the opposite of that, and that will probably be the right thing to do. <laughs> so you are contrarians. So a contrarian. Well, well, I'm a contrarian. contrarian. My wife not so much, but I'm very really? much contrarian. <laughs> and it just means the way we treat our staff, the way we, um, the way we run our business, it is is a bit more joyous and a bit more happy and a bit more about thinking. I want to be able to sleep at night. I don't want to cheat anybody. I want to be honest with everybody. Yeah having experienced those things where you put in positions where you're lying to a client when you work for a business because they say, no, don't tell them that, tell them this. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you don't have any autonomy, that's so frustrating. So when you've got autonomy, you think, well, this, you should look to create the best of all possible worlds. It's not about the bottom. We very rarely look at the bottom line. Yeah. We do the business and hope at the end well, you, of the year. You, exactly. Well, you, you, are, you yeah. are lucky that it, it's, it's working very well. Uh, this well, way. I, I don't live in a big house. <laughs> Neither <laughs> do I. That's okay, but I Neither sleep. Well. I sleep <laughs> yeah. and, and the people who work for us are all, uh, we maintain relationships even when they leave. Well, we're very happy. Yeah. Well, and, and you, 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 your agency is, is truly prestigious in the market. Oh. You're the, the young executive that. Managing director, but mm -hmm. you've, uh, you've uh, uh, instructed, mandated your wife and, and you. I think she probably has 
as a business plan or an agenda, as you are saying, oh, she, she wants does, to yeah. open. She does, but so, she really, in her previous life, before she worked with us, mm -hmm. she remembered, I hope she won't mind me, she remembered every morning in the shower crying and thinking, come on, you can do this, you can do this. Oh, because she didn't like her job? Because she hated her job, because her boss That's was a monster. Okay. Sorry, again, anybody <laughs> listening to this. But, um, it's, again, it's just thinking, I do not want anybody to feel that way mm. working for me. Yeah. They should be happy Fair and supported enough. and, yeah. Well, yeah, and she's very young as well, so it's great you gave her such a... a she is, but she has mandate. the energy which perhaps as people in our mid-fifties, we yeah. kind of lack her energy and drive. She has so much energy and drive, and she's already very well thought of within the industry. Right. And what our, is her name again? Harriet Moss. Harriet Moss. She's, uh, and our client, the age of our clientele is, is coming down. Mm -hmm. Actually, you were just saying down that your the age, the average age of your of your Rostov clients is coming down. Mm -hmm. You were saying that you also scout, so to speak, at the NFTS uh, annual a do or or yeah. uh, like opening um, uh, show and and so are these uh, uh, I mean how do you select those composers is it word of mouth or it's completely based on our own perception of their work so it would, do we like it is it interesting but how do you get in contact with these people oh there's they're peculiar peoples. Well, we're lucky people. in that usually, unless they're already established and have relationships, usually they're desperate for us to get in touch with them. I know. And in fact, most of the time we don't have to because they get in touch with us. I see. So they come to you? Yeah. We, Big pitch. we get lots and lots of submissions. Okay. And, within, and we listen to everything that's said to you, which is oh. some things you don't need to listen to for more than a couple of minutes and you know it's not suitable or it's not of a certain standard or it's not for us as an agency so it's quite straightforward actually finding do you know, actually okay great and sometimes we hear we hear somebody will come to the office and say i saw film last night blew my mind the music was unbelievable and we just see if that person's represented who they're represented by mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if they're already with an agency then we don't contact them okay because we just feel yeah if, if they were unhappy we'd know about it <laughs> and i don't want to to poach people's it doesn't seem like a good idea i yeah. wouldn't like it to happen. it's small so, yeah, yeah it's sure. a small one too. and do they are they all able to actually read and write music and uh, the reason why i'm asking this is because the composer i um, i represented a couple of years back he he, he didn't know how to write and, uh, and um, it was unbelievable, so he was every, every, doing everything by ear, but he couldn't write and read, read, read music. I, I was it's, really in awe at what he was able to achieve. It's not a deal breaker, but especially for media composition, if you're writing for film, mm -hmm. it really helps because you may have an orchestrator or an arranger or you have to give uh, the sheet music to the musicians in the studio. Right. You kind of have to. But not always. There are people who are, who are savant is perhaps the wrong word, but they, they've found a way to do it without having that skill. But they usually need somebody to transcribe the exactly. music for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah which, which is quite a job in itself. Yeah. And, and within that environment, which is quite competitive then as yeah it, it that would probably be seen that would yeah be seen as a disadvantage whether it was or not. Yeah. And these um, kids coming out of the NFTS, did they go to a, a music college or, did, or, did, or did Usually yeah. yeah. Usually they would have already had their music degree. Mm -hmm. um, in this country Leeds is a big place they go, Leeds University, they do a Leeds big, University yeah, they they do a big music. music course, okay. but then often those courses are about, they're not specific to media composition. It's okay, you can write music, 
but writing to picture is a skill in itself. Yeah, yeah. So you can't just take a composite and say, write for my film. They might not be able to do that. No, no, it's, as you said, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a skill in itself. Yeah. Yeah, so therefore, hence the second so that's what layer the of, of finishing training of the NFT. Yeah. Yes, of it's course. a finishing school, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but not the, the one for young ladies in Switzerland, a bit more in depth <laughs> than that. Um, um, do, they, do they usually play music instruments, those kids? Yeah, nearly. Almost 100% of the time. Okay. Is there a particular instrument that they play? Piano or strings? Um, or? In, in general? I'm, I'm thinking through all kinds, and most of them play several instruments. Several? Gosh. I, th I think the, if you if you took me now and started teaching me how to play something, I, I would never have, no matter what, I would never reach beyond a certain rudimentary level. Regardless of the quality of the teaching of uh, music, is you have a facility for music. Yeah, Just as I mean, people have a facility for acting mm -hmm. or any of the arts. You, it, there's something innate which allows you to flourish, mm. that puts you on that path, that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I have two brothers and uh, we, the three of us, we, we are all musically trained, okay. um, as, as far as I'm concerned, in the flute as well as pia piano, and we all went to music schools as well to learn music composition, music, you know, lead reading, etc, etc. And um, I don't know when you are like five or six years old. It's 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 okay. You know, you do this uh, one hour every night to play your instrument yeah. if you have a time. <laughs> but um, it's also a lot of. Uh, it, 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 I mean, you you learn the discipline as well. So and it's nice extracurricular activity. Um, but you're right. I think it definitely needs to be done. Uh, just be started when you are young. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. That discipline was that discipline enforced or was it innate in you that you thought, here's my hour for playing the flute, or was it a parent saying, come and practice the flute? Uh, not in my case. Probably more for my brother, Benjamin, where my mum had to say, look, you've got to play the clarinet here. <laughs> um, it's just been decided. Because your teacher has told you that you need to play one hour every night. Okay. Um, but as far as I was concerned, no, I, I, I didn't have to be to be pushed. But when when you were going to your weekly uh, teachings, the, the teacher would tell you you need to rehearse every uh, every uh, evening one hour. So uh, I gave you quite a you know high goal to achieve. But yeah, so okay, so these kids are really multi talented. They yeah. play several instruments. They can uh, I mean score, write music. Do they also write lyrics, or is that another skill in itself to write? Oh, that's a skill in itself. It's a skill. And, and also, I'd say you can be. The reason perhaps they go to the NFTS is that in my experience you can have people who can write music but they can't write music to picture but equally you can have people who can write music to picture but if you say we if somebody if somebody uh, uh, applies to us to desire and representation yeah. we'll ask for their music sure what do you Don't write when there's no picture and quite often they have nothing they have nothing. Because they are trained to write to a pitch and without that stimulus, they, they, they can't have don't know where to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are plenty of our, of our clients who are multi-talented, who can write music for themselves or for pitch or for whatever, but there are those who, who are very focused on meeting music. I think that was our experience. Your, your, Composer, yeah. he had written music, but it was it didn't have a voice. It was kind of an imaginary film. Yes, here's some danger, here's some romance, and that's very different from what's inside. I, I'm talking to somebody at the moment. With, I'm commissioning him to write an album, mm -hmm. and he's an he's, album for my label. My I have a record label. It's okay. Uh, it's tiny. Okay. So I need an insignificant. But he is about to become a father for the first time. Mm -hmm. He's reading philosophy. He's interested in climate change. So there are all these threads going into his music that are coming up that he's trying to express. 
But some people can't do that. What, what are you going to do with the album? That is well, we will release it. Oh, to release it, right, okay. That's but that's like a, a piece which has nothing to do with Nothing to do with, it's, with it's video It's purely content. music. Okay. It stands alone. Hopefully we can see Is that it. just a pet project or...? Uh... That was my 50th... <laughs> but they call me so that. that was my 50th birthday present. Ah! And my wife said, what would you like? Oh, very kind. And I said, I'd like a record label. R really? Which she thought was cheaper than buying me a Porsche. <laughs> Not like an afford one. But Is that a joke? <laughs> Well, you know, some men get to their fifties and they require something to make them feel young. <laughs> um, and I guess that was the same thing with me. I fancied a record there. It was a, as a project from scratch, figuring out how this works. You learn by doing. Yeah, sure, sure. What I've you learned need to put is... You on Spotify and all the uh, Oh, well, it is, yeah. I and mean, we've done very well. It took three years to break even because I spent so much bloody money on it. Yeah, well, but it was a, it was a labour of love. I, yeah. I, I, I enjoyed the whole process. So you broke even after three years, and um, yeah, well, through sync, etc. Ah? Through sync in the music, yeah. Through syncing as well. Yeah. Okay, that's what we sync guys is. Broken. Plus the royalties coming from the streaming. Although it was a very expensive album, we recorded it at great studios. We hired the best musicians we could find, and uh, right. Oh, so it wasn't stuff that he was doing on his on his computer because no. that's what my client used to do. He used to do most of the stuff. On no, his he did it properly. He did the draft on his computer, and then we went into the studio. And we and you recorded it properly. Where did you record? Uh, uh, I'm really very close to the um, uh, to the studio where the Beatles were recording. You know, in um, Abbey Road. Where, yeah, in Abbey Road. Yeah. Oh, we went to the other one, which is uh, Air Studios, which is George Martin's. Okay. All right. Yeah. Who was the producer? He built Air Studios. For himself. I see. Yeah, where is this? Uh, it's uh, Hampstead. Hampstead? Yes. Yeah, it's not too far. Yeah. It's uh, from, uh, from a church, but it's beautiful. From uh, right. Wood panels building. It's just fantastic. I, love and I just love being there. Oh, yeah, sure. Hampstead is fantastic. And, and where we well, worked with Peter Gregson, who's amazing, and Thomas Gould, who's now head of the Britain Symphonia. And yeah, we just had all these brilliant people. What do you mean, like, to, to recruit the. Uh, to, the to record the album. So it was just a, a fantastic experience, which I enjoyed. Do you know, I, I used to be uh, a member of a, a woodwind ensemble uh, um, uh, before I founded my firm in 2012 here in London. And um, when I was still working in uh, very large law firms. And so we would rehearse every Tuesday night, if I remember well. And the one project I really, really enjoyed is when actually we did some recording sessions for a composer who had written some... Um, uh, yeah, some uh, you know some 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 music for a particular project, and then we recorded that, etc. So we, we were not uh, we were not, we didn't we had to be very careful not to make any noises. Love that. It was really um, it was uh, yeah it was really a joyful experience. The rest of the rehearsing was a bit painful, but but yeah. you know when you we, we would see this um, pinnacle of. Um, like this achievement, and then you could hear yourself afterwards um, when it had been edited, etc. I found it fantastic. Most of the time, we were actually recording in churches for some reason right. in the weekends or my weekends. <laughs> it was okay, I, I loved it. Um, well, as somebody you see with zero talent, I have an. Why art, do you say that? Because I have no musical talent whatsoever. Maybe, maybe you didn't have a chance to learn. But it is, it is a thing which meant I could make a big contribution. Yeah. And have an executive producing credit, and that was that was worth everything. Oh, I thought. But why I do you say don't have any talent? Well, you are able to actually pinpoint exactly what are the strengths and the weaknesses of a composer whenever you listen to the music. I yeah, was I cool. was really struck, you know, when you gave me all this extreme insightful feedback about oh, this client. Good. This That's seriously, good. this music composer. I was, oh gosh, he's so, he's so on the money, you know, in, in, in his uh, ah, assessment of... That's just experience, though. That's experience. Although that's a skill in itself. This is, this is, uh, uh, this is talent. Sure. Yeah. I would never have said that to a composer. Yeah, it was only, I remember our exchange, yeah. and I said, look, the, when a composer says, what do you think of my music? Right. I'm never honest. Is it because we've got too much of an ego? Is it well? Yeah, yeah, you tell them to. These are people who have worked by themselves in a room by themselves and created this thing, and then it goes out in the world. Yeah. And to have some completely 
untalented, musically untalented guy like me say, I don't like that music. It's just, it's too cruel in a way. Because I admire it because they have this facility which I do not possess, so it's not for me to criticise them to their face. I think they've done something that I could not do anyway. Right. But don't you see it more as a as constructive feedback so that they improve their output? Uh, They're very output? sensitive. They're yeah, very that, that sensitive. I know. Well, I do think that the, <laughs> there you go. I, I, I do think that the feedback that, that which I then passed on to this okay. client of mine was music because I think it was useful for him. Because, okay, good. You know, the fact that you said that he, he, he needed to develop his own style and that yeah. because of all these different jobs that he had in the advertising industry, then he had it was a bit of a chameleon being able to uh, change his style every, every for every job. So he also needed to yeah. develop his style. You need I think to it was, develop your own voice, your own exactly, style. Exactly, as you yeah. were saying. And uh, oh, on this note, actually, I remember when you mentioned that two years ago, you cited Johan Johansen mm -hmm. as having developed his own voice. What, what ever happened with this guy? Did he, did he, did he, did he, he was an overdose, right, in Berlin? He overdosed. There's a, there's a culture with it. I'm not sure if it particularly applies to him, and I can't claim to. I know people who know him yeah. or knew him. Yeah. I can't claim to know for certain. I was sad. But there's a certain uh, culture in music, which is why it's been male dominated to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. In the studio, it's like men boasting that I've been in the studio for 48 hours, I've been in the studio for 72 hours. I know, yeah, yeah, okay. So as, if, as if there's nothing else, out. this is all there is, it's that male it's fixation on one thing, which is not a, a feminine trait, if you'll forgive me for saying this is feminine, that is masculine, but women are not anal like men, in that they don't, yeah. So th there was a great Except thing. Margaret Thatcher. Hmm? Except Margaret Thatcher. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, no, no, I, I'm thinking. Yeah. There was this French musician called Renaud who actually made a song about Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, and it was like, uh, yeah, she's 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 more vi 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 viril, yeah, uh, like, uh, yeah, than, uh, than, than any man around. But it was just a joke. So um, yeah, it's quite true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, do you think this is what happened? He basically exhausted himself and probably resorted to coke um, and, uh, uh, and bang, uh, uh, himself. I think he was taking amphetamines in order to stay awake for longer, so he could uh, and keep working. Cash and like but Elvis. he was—he's quite a big guy, yeah. so, so his heart eventually. Is that what happened? Oh, well, I don't know. I do. I, I, you, you I don't. I like yeah. to. Uh, I'd like to vote yeah. as my disclaimer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's my best okay. guess. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thing is, I suppose that recording costs and you know uh, studio costs are pretty high. So it's probably why you they sort of do it. It's, it's more stuff. an obsession. Is it really? Yeah, it's more okay. a, a mad obsession. Okay. It's like the the. Um, it's a funny. It's a funny story actually. Um, when the uh, uh, income tax rate. Um, uh, uh, went up 70%, uh, as I'm sure you know, the Rolling Stones immigrated to France, right? Yeah. And they went to this uh, uh, French villa, which is on the peninsula of um, uh, uh, saint jean cap ferrat which is a very, very uh, smart and posh neighborhood of south of France. <laughs> saint jean cap ferrat and they were in this, this villa, but they were playing and jamming up until 5 or 6 in the morning. So they got kicked out of the residence, the local residents just couldn't stand, the, you know, they just couldn't stand it, they were on drugs all the time. And they were jamming, they, actually they were starting working at 1 or 2 a.m. And they would just work the whole night, record the whole night. And so after, after uh, uh, one or two months, they, both the residents just uh, kicked them out. <laughs> that was the end of the exit in France, the exile in France. <laughs> it's a miracle that they have managed to survive. Oh, I saw Ronnie, I saw Ronnie, the, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood. Ronnie Wood in the street, uh, actually on the South Bank uh, with his young wife. With his young wife. And his, his young two baby, years old yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, twin daughters, and they were going to, to, to the Tate two weeks ago. It must have ago. all had mass organ transplants or something. How <laughs> yeah, they were they, they still They were cute. The streets? They were cute. They were cute. Um, anyway, so. How so? How how is that? So I understand the supply chain on the um, on the creative side in terms of you finding all these composers and 
nurturing their skills, making them find their own voices. Mm -hmm. But then how does it work in final, uh, in terms of finding some assignments for, um, so do you work mostly for independent film studios or film production houses or also for majors, like Deep the Disney and Universal and One uh, Office World or Service Office World or props? Uh, it, uh, a thing with uh, circumstances has changed massively over just the last few years right. is that previously, unless you had an LA agent, you had no chance of working in LA. So you, you, the, the director might want you, the producer might want you, but if you're represented by a, a, an yeah. agent in Paris or Berlin or London, yeah. they're not interested. You have to have an LA agent. So that was always a bar. Is there a reason why they are like this? Well, it's an industry town. It looks after itself, doesn't yeah. it? One thing that yeah. I noticed when I was in LA um, two or three years ago is that it's very... Uh, it's, it's a microcosm, and they just, they, they, it's, it's a space, I mean, I'm not, well, no wonder it's called Los Angeles, you know, the Angels, that's yeah. that town, but it's very spacey, and people are very um, in, inward looking, you know, and um, they're a bit scared of the rest of the world, um, and also because of the difference of the time zones with Europe, it, it, they, they seem to be really like in their own world, and it's floating, you know, on the, uh, I love it. Because I'm, I'm myself quite you know a bit spacey sometimes and uh, up there in the in the clouds and um, uh, but 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 uh, so I love it but I did notice that they were not the most interested in the rest of the world no. kind of people so everything yeah. is in LA yeah, yeah everything yeah. they need that entire infrastructure is local and so there they keep it that way but that has changed because the major studios are, are not yet been asserted but. So much work is coming up. Netflix and Amazon sure. and Google is starting, and Apple are going to start. But, but these guys are they are headquartered in um, in Burbank yeah. and um, and uh, Culver City and everything. So but, uh, are they more open minded? Oh cool, yeah. Okay. In terms of where the if if you look at the what Netflix and Amazon and all the rest that are producing, yeah, it, it's much more international. Where they go on all the film markets. I mean, it's not complicated when you whenever you go to Berlin. Berlin Berlin and the Berlin film market, or in Cannes, in the first week, the Netflix and Amazon Prime of this world just do their markets and they take all the best, yeah. um, all the best content. Yeah. And so after the indies, they're like, oh my god, I don't have the money to pay for this and this and this, and then they just select the best yeah. um, Netflix and, um, and Amazon Prime. Because so they don't. And they're all, yeah, it's true. But they just, they don't spend too much time from, thinking about it. No, they've got such deep pockets. I mean, all this cash we're yeah. making, you know, every month. For all these subscriptions, we need to reinvest them in something. And the LA-based studios are quite conservative in their approach because they want to control everything. That's very different. Here it is. Take you know, very different. Yeah. So, so the, the, that has changed, and so we're good finding without it is good for us without even finding without having an LA office. Yeah, we find ourselves working on projects that. We would normally, if it was if it was LA based, we wouldn't get anywhere near. The whole thing has changed, which is lovely. So yeah, for sure. So how does that work? So does this mean that you have you are in contact, in touch with uh, uh, Amazon Prime and the Netflix guys who are here in London, or do you have to do back and forth Los Angeles, London, Los Angeles to to be able to talk to the decision makers over there, or? Or you meet them at the I, market? I think, I think they're just, uh, the streaming platforms, they're not so LA focused, so you don't need, well, you don't need to go there to meet Netflix. I see. Because they're in uh, the Berlin or the Paris Film Festival yeah, or London. Yeah, yeah. Or so that's where you It's them. much more international. In, in the London offices or at the, at the markets and the film the, markets. Uh, Were you in Cannes two weeks ago? I did. You yes. did? Uh, well, I didn't go. Um, Someone our, else. Our, three of our staff are going next okay. week to Cam Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Fair yeah, enough. That's a big, big deal for us, yeah. Of course. And so, uh, the other question I wanted to ask is why not get an, an LA agent? If that was an issue, why not make well, like a sort of alliance with an LA agent? Well, or maybe you did. Uh, we sort of did, yeah. Okay. We sort of did. Um, in that we found something that we thought. Because LA is a, a, it's it's tough, huh? it's so tough, and everybody's just trying to 
they will trample over yeah. the bodies of their enemies to like get that, to yeah. what they want. Yeah. And it doesn't really go along with our ethos. And yeah. My wife in a negotiation always says, look, there has to be a solution to this where we all walk away with something we want. Maybe not everything we want, but we can all walk away with something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas there it's much more doggy dog and right. I want everything. Super. It's aggressive and. Type it's, a male, yeah. my, yeah. my male approach, yeah. Wow. A male approach, yeah. And again, that's another reason why it's changing because it is becoming. I mean, underneath, who knows? Maybe it's all men are still in control of everything anyway. But you do get the sense that women are getting more opportunities within the business. Mm, yeah. We'll see, we'll see. It may oh, be, no, it may be mean, just, it no, just, just another way. Like, I'm not saying no, I'm, I'm just, I was just thinking about what you were saying. I think that what I noticed as well is in the, um, the creative industries, especially in music, probably in films as well, mm -hmm. is that the, the top management is still very much trusted by the baby boomers. Yeah. Who have a top, like, I mean, Seymour Stein, for example, who actually was the, the guy who, 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 you know, who scouted and found Madonna and gave her his first um, uh, uh, trump, trumpet, her, yes, yes, and, yeah. and also the Ramones, etc. Yeah. Et so this guy is a dinosaur of the music industry, but he's well into his late 80s, probably, yeah, late, late 80s. Last time I, I heard him at Medem, I mean, I could just see that his mind was no longer functioning properly. I was like, this is embarrassing. This is this is really embarrassing. Some someone needs to tell him that he needs to retire and do something else. So, and, and I'm so sorry, Shimmerstein, if you're listening to this. It's it, it's just <laughs> because you, you've done some wonderful things in your life, and you also did a fantastic podcast with. Um, uh, uh, Bob the Feltz uh, recently, okay. where you were really pristine and fantastically insightful. But uh, I'm afraid in in the, in, in, in the life situation and meet them two years ago, perhaps you were too hot or a bit thirsty or something. But it was really embarrassing for you. To, so, and I'm like, and this is what this is what I see a lot of them. They, especially Americans, they do not retire. They do keep on going, 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 and so until it becomes embarrassing. And they also come with all the background of the way business was being dealt with, and it was being done in the fifties or the seventies, which is, as you were saying, with certain bias, perhaps in terms of gender bias or other type of bias. Um, and yeah, and so so this is something I've really noticed in the creative industries. It still exists in the majors, if you as you make your way up through the floors, through the hierarchy, you usually end up in a room full of men who are older than me. Because right. okay. they've been there forever yeah. and they're not going to move any time soon. And they're the last people you want making the decisions. Seriously? Yeah, really. Because they are... They should oversee things. Yeah. We, we, are, we, are not, we, are not we are not a big company. Yeah. But I have Harry who's... Uh, 27, 28, I wish I could remember, but I'm, if, if she's sure, and I can't hear uh, it, I go with... she have yet? 28? She's not yet 30 yet, she's 28. Oh, she, I don't, she hears she, things that I don't, I don't, she goes to all the gigs, she goes to all the clubs, she understands what the sound they're looking for is, I don't. This woman is amazing. She is amazing, yeah. Oh, I hope you're listening. Uh -huh. <laughs> she just has a lot there, as does everybody who works for us, because they're all in their twenties. I'm a very poor herald for our company, because the founder was my wife, <laughs> and just about everybody who works for us is a woman. Okay. Half my age. I pretend they're all my children. <laughs> but they, it, you have to accept they have a better ear for contemporary. Sounds than I do. Me? Yeah, because, well, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that. Mm. I'm just very glad I've got them to tell me, no, you're wrong, this is really good, and what we're going to do. Oh. I still I'm still listening to everything, but I, sometimes I just can't hear it, and they can. And, they can and I accept that they're right, and because they're more the age of the audience, they're more the age of the artist. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. How do you share responsibilities with um, Catherine, um, Ariane and yourself? Would you say that you are more on the creative side and the publishing side of things? Or would you say that um, 
um, Catherine and to a degree uh, Ariette to the negotiations of the contracts for um, with, okay. the, with the end clients, the the buyers, so to speak, of the, of the music. I mean, Catherine said a bit of a step back from the company. Okay. Partly just working herself. Too much. Too much, yeah. Mm. She needed to step back. Wow. And also, she's now on the board of the MPA, the Music Publishers Association. Okay. So that's so it allows her to take a much wider view of the industry and not being so focused on the mm -hmm. minutiae of the company. Yeah. She's much better as a negotiator, etc., than me. Because again, as a as a man, just a man, I, I'm perhaps sometimes. My fuse is shorter. <laughs> My instinct is to be more aggressive. Uh, I mean, you know, there are some men who are very good negotiators. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. yeah, so. I, I don't like getting into, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus kind of thing. <laughs> but, she's the business well. <laughs> but she is a fantastic. If she's sat in a room full of men mm -hmm. who are all waving the dicks around, she's very good at. And just deflating on them. Oh, I'm just saying, come on, let's, let's all be grown ups. Mm. Well, what do you see with sort of very aggressive negotiation style? Is it with clients who are more from like Southern Europe or the US or even with British uh, I, I people? Can't, it completely or? Depends on yeah, because it's not a, a, a sort of negotiating style that I've seen very often uh, in the UK, you know, being super aggressive, etc. But perhaps, as you were saying, in LA, perhaps they just uh, have no <laughs> they limits. Have no to, yeah, exactly. They have no limits to the expectations, yeah. and they just try, you know, work you to the ground. They, yeah, they just want the best deal for their yeah. company. They don't give a shit about it's you. It's a very short-term view, though. Yeah. But, hey, but yeah, well, it's short-term because most of them are just looking for the next job, the next level. Okay. They're looking to do well on that level so they can move up a level. What, you mean internally in this major? No, in, in terms of you, you're negotiating with somebody who's from a major. Yeah. They, they don't care about the relationship or anything. They really? care about the next. Oh, so they won't be there for the next, the next yeah, year? Yeah, exactly. Could be there, yeah. Okay, wow. <laughs> okay. Um, fascinating. Um, and so, stop me if I'm, I'm going into something which is just too private, but how do you make money? I've talked about this. <laughs> I mean, how do you get paid? That's a good question. No, seriously. Well, where, 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 how are the gentlemen? Do you have a contract with your clients, which is for you take a percentage of their. Okay. We're, we're very unusual, if not unique, that if we uh, are one of our clients is given a project, a TV series, yeah. they get a music budget. Now, usually the agent takes their 20% off yeah. the top. Yeah. We take what's left after they've recorded. And pay themselves. This is very poor business because sometimes they get so involved in a project they spend the right, entire right. blood of music. So you're, so you're saying that you get 20% of what's um, left after they've paid for all the uh, music what, production that's costs? Off, that's often what we do. Yeah. I know, it's stupid. And there's every other agent going, what the... F <laughs> but... Does it work? Just, Does it uh, work? We're still here after 20 years. Is it, was that always your business model? Yeah, pretty much. Because, it, because we desire to work with people who, who have a passion for it. They're not just doing it because it pays them money and they're not just taking projects on because it pays them money. They want to do the best job they possibly can. And sometimes that means they spend the entire music oh God. So we so we don't earn much off that. So basically what you need to do as a good skilled negotiator and sure negotiator is to make sure that you have a large music budget. Well, yeah, as, as large as possible. And you try and manage the budget and yeah. say, look, you're spending everything here. Mm. But if, if they get, a, if they're really involved and they really want to, well, we let them do what they want. So what are the biggest costs? Is it the, soft, the cost of the software, the licensing of the software, or is it the cost of hiring the session musicians? Yeah, it's the musicians, the studios. But why don't they just do it, uh, they can't do it on, uh, on, um, on uh, using software to the recording of the music? Well, they, uh, it depends on the budget. Okay. If, 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 they say, if they say, okay, we've made a film and our music budget is 5,000 pounds, well, you're getting something that comes out of a laptop. 
Yeah, if you if you want musicians in the studio yeah, that yeah, full five hot mix, you're going to have to pay ten times that. Yeah, of course. To get yeah. anywhere near it, yeah. Of course. And so, do you use, often use the studio recording studios of the air recording studios? Uh, uh, air is quite there, popular or? with our composers. Yes. Yeah. So, so you've been there long, many times with your yeah, with I suppose your, yeah. Your composers. Okay. It's Abbey Road sometimes or never? Have I? Well, do you use the Abbey Road Studios from time to time? Uh, really? People have used it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Uh, but then there's, uh, because budgets aren't what they were, there are much smaller studios like Air Chin Studios. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it come, uh, some people do it, uh, they have their own studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's becoming very popular. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of bands today And, and technology allows that because... Correct. Yeah. Yeah, which is awesome. I mean, the, it concerns me slightly the, Why? Qu the quality of the samples okay. coming out of Spitfire. Okay. If, if you're skilled at, at, at tailoring them, they can get very close. So people in our office will listen to something and you can say, is this a sample or is it strings? And they really struggle to tell sometimes. Wow. Five years ago, mm -hmm. they would not meet. Okay. But now it's kind of, where is that? So the technology in the AI is becoming better and yeah. better. Yeah. Oh, that's good for your business. To decrease the cost. There's so much more pleasure in hiring musicians and doing that big collaborative thing and it's more organic. Well, you can keep that from your record label. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, you could spend so much money making an album, it's untrue. So yeah, absolutely, I agree. But yeah, is there something about the process? Okay, you, you, you get commissioned, we want you to score this film, but we only have a limited amount of money, mm -hmm. so therefore as a composer you can only do so much. Yeah. If you want to write with strings and organic instruments and mix that with electronics, it costs a lot more, but the process itself is so much more satisfying. Uh, I, I went to... Uh, do, you take, do you take part in this process? Do you go to a recording session? Quite often, yes. You do? You enjoy One that? And it's yeah. to support the... I mean, several members of our staff can do music coordination, so they can help with the... With that, also the composer just likes the fact that you've turned up and you're offering support so they're not alone. Okay. There's lots of things. It's just small incremental things that you add to the process that makes it easier or happier or, yeah, we support them. That's awesome. So... And also the people in the office love going to these. Sure. I mean, studios are usually beautiful places to be. Uh, there's a rehearsal space up Bond Street called Music Rooms, okay. which I went to for the first time. I didn't even know it existed. Right. And there's a Probably door next to it. Yeah, and it's this beautiful Georgian building with these wonderful windows, and it's just a plain room like this one we're sat in with wooden floorboards. And there were three cellos, two violins, and they were just rehearsing because they were going to record an album a week later. And it's just, and it's beautiful. Yeah. It, it adds to the quality of your life rather than sat in front of a laptop by yourself. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, sh 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 as I was and saying before. And all those before, musicians are being yeah. hired and... F yeah, for me, yeah, I, just, it's the lifeblood of the whole thing. Exactly, exactly. When I was at the Woodwinner summer, I had also this sense of achievement when, when I was yeah, doing exactly. those recording sessions. So even for you, even if you're not playing the instruments, I completely understand that it's like a, a real sense of fulfillment when you can see everything materializing in doing this yeah, recording of this, this, this composition, etc. Um, this question is completely coming out of the blue, but I really would like to pick your brains about this. Okay. Do, you, do you like uh, Yorgos Lantanimos, the guy who's done um, all these weird films? Um, I think that's his name. He was in actually a member of a jury uh, in Cannes yeah. two weeks ago. So he's this Greek director who uh, mainly makes films in, in, in the UK actually and it yeah. probably was trained on the NFTS. But there's no money in Greece for making films. <laughs> 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 
And so, and he's done really gems, um, uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, yeah. uh, the one which is done with the three ladies, I'm desperate trying to, to remember the name of it, which is fantastic, and the, I watched it twice. It won the bloody Oscar, didn't it? Okay. Uh, yes, of course, with um, uh, um, Coulson, with oh, um, for, what is the see what you see one, yeah. And the one before that, I remember seeing, that was his yes. first one. Um, this weird island. <sighs> Killing of a second year, so it be at yeah. the BFI Film Festival last year. Oh my god. And so my point is uh, that in all these films, the music score is are so weird. The music is always um, stressful, completely off uh, offbeat with what is happening on it's the to unsettle the list of resumes. Yeah. yeah. So what do you what do you make of this technique of, of unsettling the uh, the viewer of, of his films by having some 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 uh, music which is completely either unrelated to what is happening on screen or um, really weird? Well, it becomes instead of enhancing or instead of embellishing, yes. it becomes a feature. So you can't ignore that music. And that's for, for sure. <laughs> It's in your face. Yeah, it's <laughs> very much in your ears. Yeah, it, I don't. I guess there's a place for that, and his films is the perfect place for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are quite unsettling themselves. To, to see yeah, the it, it adds to the overall. Uh, the the overall favorite. Of the the, the favorite. favorite. Oh, oh thank gosh, you. I love that film. Oh, thank you. For yeah, that. I would favorite. have gone mad not thinking that. It was, uh, and yeah, okay. So that's like a technique. It's a technique to. Um, Basically, perhaps to push the emotions of a, of a viewer. Of a there are, there are them. very few, there are not many directors who really understand music. Well, I think he's one of them. Don't you think? He's one of them. Yeah, he's one yeah of them. absolutely. It, and it is because you think, my goodness, mostly. It's not sexy. His music is not sexy. Because these are visual artists, so they're not. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's rare they have a strong sensibility of, of music and what music they want. Mm, yeah. Because often we come to a project, when they make a film, they will uh, add a temp track. So they will, the editor or whoever will choose music that underpins the scene okay. well enough that it makes it watchable. <laughs> the problem is often... Right. They get so attached to those temp tracks because they've edited the film and over months. Mm -hmm. So in the end, that's the only music they can hear. What so they so that they go to the composer and say, "This is the music I want." But what? what was, and they have to do a pastiche. Is that a click track or is, what's a what's a temp track? How would you define this? So well, when, when they're editing the film. Um, they add music, usually from other films, I see. To, uh, to to make it a more watchable thing to give it. Ah, so you were not joking. It's really okay. Uh, is that what, what they do with these? So room? so often they will come then to the final composer and say, "This is Just the reference. Which, uh, this is what we like. This I is no what idea. we." Like. I had no idea that we're doing this. Film make, film directors. Yeah, that's quite common. Uh. Yeah. So, so it doesn't give you a blank slate. It doesn't allow no. you to watch it and perceive it yeah. and add your voice as a composer. And how do you explain that to your clients? When oh, you they know? understand it. It's oh, they understand. Part, it's part yeah, of the job. Absolutely part because of Because it's like really a customary practice. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, there are <laughs> composers who will not do that, who are not interested in that, who will say, I'm, uh, find somebody else. Because I do what I do, I don't copy, and it's nearly always either Max Richter or Anzu. Uh, yeah. It's like, that's not what I do. Probably you and your Hansel wasn't doing that as well, because his music is so different he from was, everything else. Well, he'd, he'd, he'd done so much as a recording artist before he came to so film. He had his so own he voice. already had his own voice, and mm -hmm. people knew what they were hiring. Mm -hmm. There are very successful composers who you would struggle to find a common thread through all their work because they're quite happy to have somebody say, this is what I want, I see. and for them to go away and do it. Oh. Uh, we publish Nils Farm, and he's very 
popular and people want him to score things. What has he done, for example? Sorry. Short well, he did, he's, he's, he did Victoria, which was the right. German film, which was all one take. Oh, uh, yes. Uh -huh. And he wrote a beautiful score for that, but on the basis that he was allowed to just write what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for a director to say, well, I like that, but make this more noisy or that more dramatic. Or what. He just said, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And Matthew Herbert is another one. I think he just, he has a, you have a discussion with the director, a creative discussion, but ultimately you hope he, he or she is trusting you mm -hmm. to go away and provide what you, what, you're supposed to bring it to me. Is Matthew Herbert part of, part of your roster? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what has he done for you? Well, he, he did Fantastic Woman and oh, Gloria yes. Bell. Sorry, and okay. yeah, he, he did those. What a, a touching film, Fantastic Woman. Yeah. Very touching film. And, and beautiful, simple music, which was just... I mean, it's not the first film he'd done, but it was the, it was the one that kind of launched his career as a film yeah. composer. Mm -hmm because he didn't try too hard. It's very subtle. Mm, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful score. There's not a, a massive amount of cues. And that's the other that's the other thing they have to learn, which is a, a bane of modern filmmaking, that they want music over everything. There's just a shit ton of music. Yeah, okay, and and actually, actually, powering. Yeah, and, and, and the skill is saying, that is what they call spotting, when they watch the film and say, we need music here, we need music here. Ah. That's a real art, to decide, okay, this is fine. You, 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 you see so many things where it's two people having a conversation with this music underneath it. It doesn't need it. You've got to, right, 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 yes. you've got to let it breathe and yeah. let it, yeah. It's, it's actually quite unnerving for someone who is viewing film when you've got like a little violence coming out and when you're yeah. just trying to focus on the dialogue. And <laughs> yeah. um, is, that, is that something that um, this sort of constructive dialogue between the director, the editor and the, uh, the composer? Well, is this, is what you, that, this is what you're hoping for. This is the ideal situation. But uh, is that something that you are kind of overseeing? No, or, or you no, uh, are no, you, mentoring you, them a bit, the composers in this, if you have a question and we want to, you know, tap your brains about something, about how to find... No, the not, not, not really. No, that's not something you get. No, to I think that it, it does happen, but, on, but usually if they're having some Sorry. problem with the production or whatever. Yeah. But usually, once they get into it, the relationship is between the director and the composer. That's it. We don't get in between that at all. Okay, so they're very, really like fully formed professionals. With, uh, yeah, with, with, absolutely. With, yeah. Composers, you, 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 yeah. Yeah, you have to accept that you're not some mad genius because mm. everything rests on this. You can't just say, no, I want to do this instead. You, you have to work within certain parameters probably, but that comes from the conversation with the director and hopefully within that you just get them to trust you yeah. and back off and you go and write your music. Yeah. That's the ideal. In commercial, in commercial TV etc, that doesn't really exist. I don't know if you, well, Ray, you should have a time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the fantastic retrospective of uh, Stanley Kubrick's um, Films at the uh, Design Museum. I haven't been to the Design Museum. I still want to. I, must. I actually uh, I enrolled myself as a as a as a an annual member because that, that was the deal. You know, since they were sold out of tickets, I so wanted to see that exhibition. I said, fine, I'll pay the sixty quid to um, to become an, uh, a, yeah. a member of the Design Museum. And so I saw this beautiful exhibition in which it was mentioned several times that um, Stanley Kubrick mainly actually shot some masterpieces, I think you can really say. Oh, without question. Yeah, well, I mean, everything he did was outstanding. But he had a reputation for taking takes, after takes, after takes, after takes, to the point that sometimes it was just exhausting the, uh, the actors. So the point I want to get at is, do you have situations where uh, a director is actually so De demanding and pe peculiar in his or her wants that the uh, film composer has to work on and on and on on the music composition for the film score? 
Yes, though most projects have deadlines. Okay. So, right. so okay. that curtails that. But often, not often, sorry, you will get occasions when directors become very demanding and are asking for revisions, endless revisions. Actually, it's because they can't articulate or don't have the musical knowledge to be able to direct somebody. Explain what they want. That's what they, that's the problem. Okay. Uh, so we've had people who've walked away from projects because it just, young, this is never going to happen. This is, no, we're never going to reach that point where, because that person doesn't know what they want. So you're almost, right, right you can end up writing music randomly. What about this? What about this? What about this? So how do you, how do you uh, sort of like, structure a, a film director who is, is going a bit, uh, uh, you know, a voc like this, I mean, who is, you know, in, uh, in all places, how do you structure him? Do you, do you come to the rescue of your film composer with this situation? Uh, there's, there's, you, there's usually a point where the composer says, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. Right. Oh, oh, gosh, that's, 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 already, so, that's already too far, too, 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 so, too yeah, late. <laughs> they've become so unhappy and so stressed and they've lost any confidence that they can give the director what they don't know that they want. So, so this does occur. So they walk away. Yeah. They walk away, my gosh. So they, pay, they work like this and they don't get paid? On the... Oh, well, that's usually part of the contract. Oh, they use one um, yeah, there, is, there are kind of Retainer. increments. Okay. Yeah, you've been in for so long. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Wow. Well, it's very hope, rare you walk away with nothing. Yeah, I hope, oh, yeah, and I hope that situation I just mentioned doesn't uh, happen too often. But, um, well, no, again, because deadlines yeah, mean you right. can't do that. Mm -hmm. It has to be finished. Yeah. It has to be broadcast. It has to be released. So, yeah. Fair it, enough. That kind of stops that. Uh, but usually it's because of a, it's you, it. 90% of the time it's the director's problem, not the composer's. Okay. Because they just don't know what. Yeah, but you know on which side you are. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's so the, is that really fair? That underpins me. We talked earlier about advertising. Yeah. They send you a brief and they say, okay, well, here's the film, and what we want is music that is, and then the list of adjectives, and then sort of like, and then a reference towards a pop track. Or gosh, something. we still do this. Oh my gosh. But, Sounded like. But by the time you get to the end of the project, what they end up with had bears no relation to their initial requests. Well, just as well, because then they won't get sued. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> and so, actually, on this note, um, how would you say your sort of revenues are being split uh, between the um, the film industry, the gaming industry, the advertising industry, um, I suppose the advertising industry is, is a very important chunk of the revenue. Well, they, they usually have generation. decent budgets. Oh, yeah. Still, still. Still. They usually are not as they used to be, but they still have decent budgets. Is that for TV ads? Yeah. yeah. And, and similar ads or whatever, but they, they still have a decent budget and they kind of know what they want. They're fairly sure okay. what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And there are composers who are incredibly adept at that area of the business, but for whatever reason, they can't transfer those skills to a dramatic TV series. They're really good at writing to brief. Okay. Uh, and, we, and we make money from advertising, we make uh, money from uh, TV, particularly TV series. TV series, okay. What for the bits? BBC, ITV channel, or whoever. Oh, okay. Uh, Fantastic. Film we love doing, but we rarely make any money from. Because we only take our cut after they've finished recording, by which time the British, well, I was reading recently about the French film industry, which receives 250 million euros a year in subsidy, and Macron wants to increase this. Of course he does. And yet, I can't remember the last French film which transcended the domestic audience. I know. It's a lot of shit which is becoming, uh, coming out of this market. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's almost too easy. Yeah. Here's the money, go and make a film. Yeah. Where's, the, where's the... But you know, I'm actually writing an article, starting on Monday, but then I have to stop because 
I needed to focus on my client's work, but uh, I'm, hopefully I will finish it by the end of this week. One thing you have to bear in mind though, all this soft money, but even the financing coming from the TV channels, French TV channels, a lot of that is being siphoned into paying the um, the actors' salaries. The right. French actors are so greedy, apparently, right. and so there's hardly. Oh, it's just funny because my um, my my um, my article is about how can you make it as a film music composer on the French market, and that's exactly what the problem is. is that a lot of the uh, uh, budget for the French film production is actually allocated. Uh, uh, almost mandatorily to uh, pay the massive cachet, the massive salaries of uh, French stars who uh, will not get attached to a to a French project if they don't get paid millions. And and apparently, uh, French uh, actors are paid even more than uh, than in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, as you were saying, most of these films n never go beyond the. Um, most of them, there are a few exceptions, like uh, you know the um, the film about the two lesbians, um, the blue. Uh, that's a while ago. That's yeah, yeah. that's maybe ten years ago. Yeah. Is it already? So. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. I, think I don't. Right. They, they, you so, haven't had an entry into the foreign language Oscar for over ten years. Oh yeah, there was the artist, which was yeah. really cool. Uh, yeah, you're right. And so these films are also not making money. They're not never recouping other costs. Uh, apparently, after the Hollywood. Um, Average, no, sorry, after the Hollywood, the France comes uh, as the highest in terms of uh, average cost per production. Mm -hmm. for film production. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're just being given money, there's no discipline, is there? Here, I think it's much more, uh, it's still quite a cowboy industry. Yeah. It, it's, uh, the budgets are quite low, but. We make very, when one of our composers gets a film, yeah, we, we don't expect to make a lot wow. of money. As, and, and what is amazing is that this is the most prestigious work that you can They all to do with the exactly. film because it's a, it's a single, mm. it, it, it's a beginning, middle end, they can do a proper score right. to it. This is what we're trained and, for. And put it also on my CV, I suppose. Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. But, but I think, I think it's, it's just they, they, they get the artistic. Satisfaction from doing mm, that. It's, mm. it's a close project. But you know, this is different actually from uh, music agents in LA because my understanding was that these guys they only focus on the uh, the film industry. Would you agree? Because well, uh, like well, the Goffin Schwartz of this world. And what we found in LA is that there are these various pockets of the industry. Okay. So there's the film industry, but then there's a huge and quite lucrative industry that just make trailers, make the film trailers. Yeah, I, I, we came yeah. to this just over 10 years ago, I think, and suddenly realized how much money they were spending on trailers and, and they would, uh, what's the word, they would commission people to write a bespoke, which, uh, which probably had more money attached to it than 90% of British films. They were Just spending the more on trailers, yeah. Yeah, well, marketing budgets. Are yeah, huge. It's, it's, yeah, but, yeah, because they know that they're going to make the money in the first weekend that the film comes yeah, out. Yeah, and so, if it's a blockbuster, you can see just after one or two days it's been released whether it's going yeah. to actually make it or not. So that's why they're just really capitalizing on the. Yeah, on, I, I mean, sorry, they, they're just really incurring a lot of costs, uh, marketing costs from the outset because they really want to capitalize on the first weekend. That's actually explained quite well in the uh, Anita Elbers book called Block Blockbusters. Okay. <laughs> so, um, right, okay. Yeah. So, so, they're all so these, it's a lucrative business in LA. all these it's pockets of the industries within LA. Yeah. Um, you know, they make uh, TV series on an industrial scale. A TV series has 22 episodes. Mm -hmm. and it just. But that's about a team of people writing the cues in advance and then just fitting them in where they want them. So that you're not even writing to picture, you're writing a library of cues which the editors then place for you. So they're all these different. But is that coming from a music library or is it like commission work? No, they commission somebody they commission. to write. So all the cues have a similar theme and an instrumentation and it identifies that program. 
but it's just almost music for people walking into a room and then a cue for them walking out of the room. And it's maybe 15 seconds. Da, 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 da. Conversation da, 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 as they walk out. Gosh, so they're all, uh, they, 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 yeah, it's this industrial process by which they produce pieces. Mm, I see what you mean. So it's more like a commodity. Yeah. It's right. more commoditized, but then. Uh, you're not, you're not spending time watching the scene thinking about the emotions of the character and uh -huh. how you can express that. It's, it's just, yeah. we want a live, you to write a library of music yeah, yeah, for yeah. this yeah. scene. Because it is a cash cow. Oh, cool. Like yeah. they have it on these cash cans. While in in the UK, perhaps where the advertising industry is also like in London, this advertising industry is yeah. very prominent. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that, that this is perhaps where the cash cow is, I suppose. I mean, um, so it's why we uh, expanded into after we become a composer agency, then a publisher. Once we were a publisher, we realised we could publish anybody. It's the same principle. Okay. Um, so then they started signing recording artists because then you could, their music is attracted to ad agencies for placement in advertisements. Recording artists? What, what do you mean? Like so people who make their living, like Nils Rahm, from releasing albums and touring. And if you publish them, then you sync their catalogue into advertisements. Right, or, a bit, a bit like, film, oh, sorry. Film, yeah. like a bit like woodwork is doing, and like, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Same, same principle, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that means that you've got several avenues of uh, where you can generate revenues, yeah, uh, yeah, with a sync with the uh, commission work coming from the ad industry. Okay, what about gaming? Is that well, that's interesting because we're, we're still seeking a path into gaming. Mm -hmm. um, games, uh, even though they're very technologically advanced as an art form, if you, if you compare it to film, I think they've reached about Charlie Chaplin stage. <laughs> so they're still not as sophisticated as they might be in certain respects. Right. <coughs> Pardon Indeed. Me. And there aren't many games outside of perhaps a few independents which have interesting scores. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, although I don't really play a lot of games, but um, not, not a lot I of mean, they, they, can, they can have very interesting instrumentation. They made um, a game recently set in ancient Egypt. Okay. It's a big, expensive game. Mm -hmm. So they used instruments from the period and research the music that was used and, and tried to enhance the whole product. But usually uh, it seems to be a pastiche of cinema music. Okay. They haven't found their own language yet, I don't think. It's some independent games maybe. Okay. But even the ones that are lauded and are not really that interesting okay. musically. Okay. It's different for the genre but it's not still not you're not going to go away and listen to that on CD. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody who no, works in that enough. industry. Fair enough. And, yeah. and a lot also, of you, would, we do, you would listen to some soundtrack for films. I mean, for example, I do listen a lot to, oh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, to the uh, um, Serra films. He did a lot of films for. Um, uh, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, Luc Besson. You know, oh. Luc Besson, he worked a lot with Eric Serra, so I, I do have Absolutely. a lot of the soundtracks of, his, of, uh, of Luc Besson's films. And also, um, yeah, some other French films I listen to the soundtracks of uh, very often. And Spotify, but Spotify fantastic, you can find everything as well. Uh, Bruno Collet, he's my a great French composer. Okay, um, I don't know him, I'll Google him. I mean, I'll Spotify him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I, uh, the gaming industry, I, I, it, it's getting there, but as, as a, they still haven't really transcended making games which are moving, which is cinema that you control. Yeah. It, it hasn't found its own purpose yet. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. I've seen some things they have in development which, yeah. which are not about narrative, they're about something else entirely. They're about sort of really expanding the nature of the medium instead of trying to slavishly reproduce a cinema feature. It's very different, very different. My last question, well, because... Um, it's getting dark. You, yeah, exactly, it's getting dark. <laughs> uh, um, how do you see the, the future of um, 
tailored composed music evolving and I mean do you do you and also do you see AI as a threat? Well it, it's, it's as I mentioned earlier I'm asking this I've commissioned this guy to write an album and for him it's coming out of the fact he's going to be a father for the first time yeah. and philosophy is reading and his interest in climate change etc. Mm -hmm. Now if AI can produce exactly the same thing that has the same effects on me as anything he writes, yeah. well, we might as well all just give up and because then we're just machines. There has to be, doesn't it? There has to be, you can listen to a piece of music and understand and empathize and feel the same emotions as the person Something does, soulful. right? Yeah, yeah and, and that's indefinable. And of course AI will be able to write music and I'm sure in American TV when they have a Twitter 2 episode season I'm sure they could run a program through it to write those little cues for people coming into rooms and cues for people leaving rooms. But as in terms of, uh, of, of being emotionally affected by a piece of music, yeah. if AI can do that, well let's just give up. So this is this is the golden goose for you, this is really what makes a difference, the fact that it, it's got something that touches your soul. And it's indefinable, you yes. can't say why it does. Maybe AI one day will manage to achieve that level, who knows, since it's being made by humans anyway. But it's, uh, Maybe. Yes, but... It's not something that, you know, I say is it good or bad, Maybe it, it might happen. But I, 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 I very much subscribe to the idea that at the point when we can make a perfect simulation of our world, mm -hmm. then the chance that we are a simulation for somebody else mm -hmm. goes through the roof. Because that's if, if we can recreate ourselves in the way we behave and act and love and live life, well then there's nothing real about us anymore, is there? Well, look, even if AI replaces the oh, if we get it here. No, but even if AI replaces the composers, and if one day it happens, you know, you feel that soul, that bit of soul in the AI content that is being produced by AI, um, why not? You know, but then I suppose your 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 business model will change because the costs are going to go. Very oh, I much think down. by the time we get there, I'll be dead. So I'm not worried. <laughs> Probably me too. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, it's, it's like some modern films they've started to. Um, recreate living actors but as their younger selves. Oh wow. Have you seen any of those examples? Yeah, well in the um, uh, uh, Martians of the Galaxy or something in the... Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Basically, Guardians of the and Galaxy. Like young cat that's like, uh, yeah, that's right, right, exactly, yeah, there you go. He was, so therefore we don't need actors really. Yeah, well I mean he was very, but he was much younger. And I'd like to think that a computer can never understand the situation and absorb it and decide how to react. But of course they will. But music is an abstract art form. Yeah. It comes from who knows where. Yeah. The source. And uh, I'm sure machines can write music, but music that really... Mm, I, as you said, yeah. But in general, are you hopeful for your field? I mean, do you think that this need for customized, tailored music for in order to enhance or or uh, or uh, yeah enhance video content will keep on growing and growing. And we do you see that we are in an economy which is um, oh, which is basically you know fostering this type of um, of product of, of output like the content like the culture, cultural content. Yes, because you have to have that human input. You have to have somebody you can explain it to and relate to and share your vision so they can write the music that completely enhances your feelings, what you're trying to project. Okay. Whether there's a computer you can talk to at some point no. who will understand what you mean and produce something, who knows? But I don't want to be around to see it particularly. <laughs> Well, managing, not, managing computers must be much easier than managing, uh, you know, music composers. An awful <laughs> lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but then, 
So within my lifetime, I can't, as much as I embrace technology and I love change, yeah. there has to be, at the, uh, to be able to commu communicate with a, a wide audience, there has to be some intangible constant, some thread that runs through all of us sure. that expresses an emotion we all feel. Yeah. And how you do that through music. Yeah. Well, as uh, somebody who can't do it, is, it seems just genius. But do you think that this need for original content from from video producers, people who produce video content, will keep on growing? And I think we, we've been through phases already. When, okay. um, at the moment, it seems to be particularly within sync. There's a great uh, enthusiasm for bespoke composition rather than to sync something that already exists. Interesting. Okay. What, in the art business? or We're In the art business particularly, okay. but that ebbs and flows. It will mm -hmm. go back to all they're interested in is pop catalogs. It, and that kind of relates to the strength of the pop market mm -hmm. and, and how pervasive that is. And so, hey, it ebbs and flows yeah, all the time. to make very some trends. Interesting. And, and, and if it came to the point where they could, you had an AI program which could score your film, then enough people would say, I'm not doing that, I want a human being. Yeah. So it will always exist, you see what yeah. I mean? It will always exist. But Fantastic. the, the industry ebbs and flows, you never know. Okay. Yeah. We, st we started, when we started, sorry, I'm rambling, when we started it was all classically trained composers. Wow. That, that they were the people who knew how to score. Mm -hmm. And then over the last 20 years that's changed enormously when now they will approach somebody who writes pop music and ask them to score. They don't know how to and they need help, but they just want that sound. They just want that. I see. Yeah. So are these people able to actually write music, those pop? Not always. No, not always. <laughs> I've been kind. They use, their, they use their ears a lot. Yeah. Wow, okay. Awesome. Yeah, so that the trends, the, like the, the tastes, the music tastes are yeah. evolving for the content. Oh, well, in, in the sense that uh, contemporary classical or whatever you want to call it, yeah. it is, it certainly has a market from mainstream, largely uninteresting, again, apologies, music like I and Audi, for example, which is fine. It's melodic, it's what's, what's name? Iron Audi, Ludovic Iron Audi, is, is super popular and is always top of the classical charts. Okay. It, it's not tremendously interesting, <laughs> but it, you know, it's mildly. but equally that's in a space with Nils Farm or Max Rix or mm -hmm. much more modern. Yeah. There, there is still a, quite an audience for this. Okay. And as we move more to a technological society, there'll be a great desire for something that's more organic and real. Because mm -hmm. because if you go to a concert and it's a guy walks out and stands behind a laptop with some, it's not very interesting. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you go clubbing, I guess. Yeah, no, it's, it's just not very interesting <laughs> to see a band play, to see human beings create something and yeah. all the tiny differences that make from performance to performance. Okay. So, yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever do away with that. Because you want to see a human being do it, not a robot. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I agree with you. Um, what I really like about this interview is that you are very passionate about what you do and you I'm really enjoy it. I do, yeah, it's absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I mean, it's so rare in the two. I mean, I think it's, most people don't really like what they do. Or they're oh, not see. passionate about well, what they do. Because, because, the whole, very passionate. because the whole point of our business was to create a world that we wanted to live in. Ex yeah. Having been unhappy, mm, yeah. having got jobs that we thought would be great and then realised that they're really not. Well, I think you, you I wanted okay. to do And, and also okay. because as a middle-aged man, you made it. Mm -hmm. I now work in an office with predominantly women half my age right. and their energy and enthusiasm means I can't be cynical. Right. If I, if I, because if I worked in an office full of men of my own age, we'd talk about football or hemorrhoids or, you know, <laughs> the conversation will be very different. Whereas they're all enthusiastic and they're, 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 I'm quite cynical about lots of things, they're not. Oh, really? So it stops me becoming that 
I mean, I quite like myself a dry sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'm one of, of, a, of a few, I guess. But, yeah, so I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. And I work and we hear music every day that I can just think of. Yeah, every right. day. Every day. Somebody will send you something new to this to. I very uh, rarely listen what's on my phone that I listen to on my headphones on the way home is all the stuff that's not released or is still in progress. So you have that real sense of being, wow, this is what's coming next. Okay. So you're always like... A, always working. And that's exciting. But it's yeah. exciting. It's, well, I'm, yeah, it's I mean, music. It, yeah, right. I'm, you know, I'm not selling stocks and shares or... Yeah. or, or <laughs> many years ago, and it was, it was a lesson in front of me, and I, uh, I forget who I was working for, it's music based. And I was at a trade show, and then stall opposite us in this huge trade fair right. was a man, he was middle-aged, he had a blazer on with brass buttons, and his sole pro product was mini kettles that you get in hotel rooms. Mini kettles, right? In hotel rooms. That's all he sold. Just one... I was like, what? I, he has to, everybody who comes up, he has to tell them why this mini kettle is so good and why they should buy it. Well, I hope he was a good salesman. I just thought he's probably goes back to his room and cries or something. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like the worst possible <laughs> existence. But that's what most people have to do the, to the get death, The death of a salesman, is that Well, God, it? yeah. <laughs> But that's what most people that's what most people have to do, isn't it? I know, I know, I know, I know. And they have to get by, you have to have a job that you perhaps you don't want. And to have sorry, Sartre said hell is other people, apparently. This was his thing. Hell is other people. Sartre, yes he did. But I think hell is when you can't choose who the other people are. <laughs> that's very well said. Yeah. And I I at least have the ability to say I don't want to work with that person. Why do I want don't to want to work on that project. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I don't have a big house. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I'm happy. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. What an insightful interview. Thank you. <laughs> you said that again. I'm, I'm not sure I am, but still. I'll, I'll take it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crefervy Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you.